Good evening. Good evening. Good to have you all out this evening. Let's take our hymnals and stand together as we sing. Turn with me to number 65. 65, just over in glory land. <laughs> The saints abide just over in the glory land, and I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land. The happy angel bed just over in the glory land, just over. In the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory land. I am on my way to those mansions fair, over in the glory land, there to sing God's praise and His glory share, just over in the glory land, just over. In the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand just over in the glory land. What a joyful thought that my Lord I'll see. Just over in the glory land And with kindred saved there forever be Over in the glory land Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land there with the mighty host I'll stand Just over in the glory land With the blood washed throng I will shout and sing Just over in the glory land Glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land Join the happy angel band Just over in the glory land Over in the glory land I'll join the mighty host I'll stand Just over in the glory land Amen. Turn ahead with me now to number 147. <clears throat> 147, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <laughs> what a fellowship, what a joy divine, Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, Leaning on the everlasting arms, Leaning, leaning, Safe and secure from all alarms, Leaning, leaning, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, Safe and secure from all alarms, Leaning, leaning, <coughs> Lasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. <clears throat> the 
blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. You may be seated. Actually, you may stand up <laughs> for the reading of our scripture, memory verse, Romans chapter 12. So if I get you to stand again, please. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12 and verses, verse number one. <clears throat> and when you found out, we'll repeat it four times. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse number one. <clears throat> Ready? Let's begin. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, except one to God, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, Holy, except one to God, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, except one to God, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And let's pray. And our Father, who would have thought that we'd be around and 2022 and yet here we are finishing the first month of this year 2022 I pray that you will do a work upon our hearts and upon our lives that will cause us to be mindful of this doctrine of sanctification that we spoke about this morning Thank you for these who've come back this evening. Thank you for those listening over the airways. And Lord, once again, you've asked us to seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. So Lord, we seek you tonight. We seek your will to be done in our lives. Lord, help us to know your will and help us to do your will by performing it in obedience. And Lord, the will of the Lord is not a difficult thing. Paul said it's a good and acceptable, perfect will. Oh, that your people would allow you to have reign over our lives, that we'd allow you to guide us, direct us, and to fill our lives with your fullness and your bountiful blessings. Bless each precious family represented here this evening. Speak to our hearts and lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Take your Bibles once again if they're still open and uh, Romans <laughs> chapter 12 and then we'll go to Corinthians and we'll kind of lay out the foundation from this morning on the matter of the subject <clears throat> sanctification and then the topic we said was Christian character and our conduct and then the title of course was the struggle of the Christian, and we looked at verses in the book of Romans 
chapter 6, 7, and 8. This evening we want to go further and look at the right philosophy of life. Uh, people have philosophical ideas on what's life all about. There are those who say whoever has the most toys at the end of your life are successful. Well, that's not what the Bible talks about for this life. And then what is the right purpose of our lives? Why are we here? Someone said the three W's, where did I come from? Why am I here and where am I going? So the right purpose in life. And then, of course, right priorities. So God has a purpose for us. God has his will for our lives. And then God has his priorities for us to live day by day. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, that word holy there this morning, we said was the word sanctification, or set apart for God, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And of course, the words which is are italicized, that means they were put in by the translators. So rightly we read, holy, acceptable unto God, your reasonable service. In verse two, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Just think about a person who gets saved later in life, maybe midlife in their mid-30s, early 40s. Uh, their minds have been set about the things of the world and the way of the world, and then so suddenly this new dimension has come into their lives and a new way of being, a new way of living. And there's somewhat of a struggle with that. But Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How has that come about? Well, by reading the scriptures, studying the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, and then be obedient to the scriptures. That you may prove, now here it is, what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. So in verse 1 said Paul that we should live a living sacrifice, our lives should be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And then verse 2 concludes with, and to know and to prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Corinthians chapter 3, and beginning at verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Think about that. God no longer has temples. In fact, the temple of the Jews, the altar, the priesthood, was all destroyed in 70 AD when Titus the Roman came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and the genealogies and the altar and the priesthood was done away. And that happened in 70 AD. So now the temple for God to dwell in, we don't have an altar, we have a pulpit, we have a platform, but of course the altar is what God would have us to have in our life, a family altar. And then we have an altar in the church house to come and to be able to submit and to bow when God speaks to our heart, we have what's called an altar call, coming forward uh, and to surrender to what God speaks to us about. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh away the wise and their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain, empty, foolish. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. 
whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. And then chapter six, please. Chapter six and verses 19 and 20. Here's the question. What? Know ye not that your body, same thing we found in chapter 3 and verse 16, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. For you're bought, bought and paid for with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, here it is, which are God's. Find, if you will, the book of Colossians, chapter number two. Wrong philosophy of life. Colossians chapter two and verse number eight. Now, Paul was having difficulty with the people of Colossians as they were trying to live with uh, religious rites and rituals and traditions and uh, with the world. And Paul was trying to turn them away from that and turn them to Christ, realizing in chapter one and verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. Remember, a mystery is something that's been hid in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament. This mystery which is among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now verse eight of chapter two. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiment of the world, and not after Christ. Now, Romans chapter 14. So wrong philosophy, the right philosophy in life, and then the wrong philosophy. Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 7 and 8. So think about that. Man is supreme. Nobody needs God. No man is an island, and yet man thinks that they are an island. They can do everything in and of themselves. We said this morning that the Humanist Manifesto, written back in 1973, man is accountable only to himself. But listen what Paul says in Romans chapter 14, tremendous, tremendous text. Verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ to the Galatians, chapter 2 and verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. And then, if you will, notice the right philosophy of life. Psalms chapter 24. Our life is a gift of God. Now, how long you're here, that's up to him. Because the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it's important unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So God gives us life, and then that life, James says, is like a, a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanishes away. So how long your life? And what do we do with our lives in regards to the Lord? Psalms 24 and verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, 
Well, of course, evolutionists don't believe that. But God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the earth is the Lord's. And, of course, that's all caps. So that's Jehovah, the self-existing one that reveals himself, that provides for us, protects us with his provision and with his power. The world and they that dwell therein. Look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the first, fifth book of the Pentateuch. Remember the Pentateuch, the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, written, of course, by Moses. Man's life is a gift from God. Think about that. Life, breath, being. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. Elijah said, the God before whom I stand, when he stood before Ahab, the God before whom I stand. And Moses writing here in Deuteronomy chapter 32, what a tremendous book, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a book of remembrance. Uh, remember, the greatest teaching is repetition over and over and over because we forget things or we're maybe lackadaisical at that moment or daydreaming and not getting the information that God wants to give to us. Do ye thus request the Lord, require the Lord? O foolish people and unwise, is not he thy father that had, see it, bought thee? Paul says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You're not your own, for you're bought with the price. So here, Solomon or Moses is right, writing the Lord that bought thee. Hath he not made thee and established thee? And then notice Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. So how does life conclude? Ecclesiastes chapter number 12 and verse 13 and verse 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So Solomon, writing the book of Ecclesiastes, a book of regret, a book of vanity, all that Solomon could ever want. He looked into alcohol with wine. He looked into lands. He looked into pleasures. Eventually, women, of course, changed his heart and took his heart away from God. And so now in the conclusion of these 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So again, man's life is governed or should be governed by God. And then notice chapter 12 and verse 14. We are accountable to God. We're going to face the Lord someday. For God shall bring every work, every deed, every, every action that you and I have ever done. That's why it's good to confess your sins and keep them confessed and under the blood. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And then Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Man's life should be governed by the Lord. Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. And remember, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, Matthew 4 and verse 4, a man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we would listen daily to God's word? And so, so Acts chapter 5, and uh, let's take it up. And verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles said, we ought to do what? We ought to obey God rather than man. And then going back to Romans chapter 14, man is accountable to God. So right, having the right philosophy that God governs our lives. God guides our life and we submit to him and yield to him 
as we learned this morning from Romans chapter 6, to submit ourselves to the Lord, our lives to the Lord. Romans 14 and verse number 12. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Verse 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Isaiah 45, 23 is what this quote is from, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. And verse number 13, let us, not, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge us rather that no man put a stumbling block or occasion a fall in a brother's way. Now, the right purpose of God. What is the right purpose of God? Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The right purpose of life. Again, Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. God would like your body and our bodies to live through God the Holy Spirit. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So the proper purpose of life is to glorify God. Uh, notice Luke chapter 9. Glorifying the Lord will cost you something. Living a sanctified life set apart for God will cost you something. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse number 23. And he said to them, if any man will come after me, here, here's a tall order. Let him do what? Deny himself. Take up his cross. I have to identify with Christ in the cross. Take up his cross Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, no, daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life. People choosing not to be sanctified or set apart for the Lord, it's my life. I'll do with my life as I want to. I'll live my life. In fact, I'm sick and tired of being under your leadership, said the prodigal son. Give me the portion that belongs to me. Hey boy, nothing belongs to you. But a loving father gave him his portion. What did the Bible say in Luke chapter 15? He wasted his substance with righted living. Got sick of home, sick of the leadership of his father, sick of his brother, sick of the work, took the money and wasted it. But then he came to himself. When he came to himself, he was feeding pigs. Now that's a Jewish story. And pigs are not to be eaten by the dietary laws of the Jews. Don't eat pig, don't eat pork. And so there he was, joining himself to a citizen of that country and he's feeding pigs. Ever been around pigs? They smell. Ever been by chickens? They smell. And so there he is. Now, he spent all. And that's what the devil does. The devil shows you the bait, but he hides the hook. And so many young people get away from God and the things of God. And you can watch them, and I've watched them over the years. So precious and so wonderful and young and coming to Sunday school and being involved in Patch Club and 
being involved with the church house and, and they're young and, and impressionable and love the things of the Lord, then they get in school. They go off to school and begin to look to their teachers and listen to their teachers' philosophies and thoughts about life and evolution and humanism and socialism and communism. And they begin to grow up and they begin to get a bad attitude if we don't spend the time to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And uh, they begin to change before our very eyes. And we preach, don't date a lost girl. Don't date a lost boy. Consequences. Mark it down. There are consequences. Just talk to someone who married a lost girl or a lost boy. Uh, just talk to someone who was a prodigal and went into the far country. Uh, <clears throat> Moses said a sin was pleasurable, but only for a season. And Moses came to his place in his life where he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy sin for a season. And he set himself apart for God. Could have been the next powerhouse of Egypt, but he walked away from it. Now this prodigal son, we're all familiar with the story, went into the far country, wasted his substance, and then he began to reflect when, when he spent all. Sin has a terrible consequences. And we say the little ditty, sin will take you farther than you want to go, cost you more than you want to stay, pay, and keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And when that boy began to stink, when that boy actually began to think about eating pig's food, he remembered his father. And in Luke 15, verse 18, he said, I'll arise and go to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against thee, no longer worthy to be called thy son. And the Bible says in verse 20, what a wonderful text. And he arose and went to his father. God is a loving father. God is a passionate father. God is a caring father. God is an understanding father. God is a forgiving father. And yet, <clears throat> young people get away from God and they go off in the far country and they pay a horrible price. Venereal diseases, drugs and alcohol and all these things come your way. We don't sell drugs in our church. We don't sell alcohol in our church. And we try to encourage the family to be for God and to be faithful for the things of the Lord. And so Jesus is saying here, for whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world? How long do you live? James says, what is your life but a vapor that appear for a little time and vanishes away. So you get all the money, all the money you can have, and then you die, maybe prematurely. And then who shall have all that money and all that blessings? For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world or lose his own soul or lo lose himself or be cast away? What service shall be ashamed of me? Whose service should be ashamed of me and my words? Well, you know, I just don't want to be around Christians anymore. I, I found another group in school. I found a group on the job. You know, sometimes it's a blessing and uh, it's bittersweet when our children get jobs and begin to make money. <clears throat> and while they're making that money, they're under the influence of bosses and other colleagues and workers, and they can take you away from God quicker than you can bat an eye. And the sadness of it is sometimes they never come back. Sometimes they never come back. And you can preach to them and warn them and tell them, look out, look out, look out. The devil gives you the bait 
but he hides the hook. And in some cases, it's too late. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and the holy angels. So right priorities. This is a life of self-denial. This is a life of surrendered life. This is the crucified life. You're familiar with the verse. I quoted it, but just look there in Galatians chapter 2 momentarily. Galatians chapter 2. What a tremendous, tremendous verse. Galatians 2 and verse 20. When Christ died, I died. When Christ died, I died. That's where salvation begins, at the cross. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He rose again from the dead. Thank the Lord for the gospel, the good news. Shed his blood. His blood and payment for our sin. His blood. Payment. Paid in full. Redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the traditions of your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who was foreordained before the foundation of the world was manifest in these times for you. Precious, precious blood, precious Savior, precious Son, not I, but Christ, just get that. Christ liveth in me. That's sanctification. I want Christ to live in me. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Paul said to the people at Philippi, not that I have apprehended. I haven't arrived, but I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, forgetting those things that are behind. Preachers will use that text. Teachers will use that text in the new year, forgetting that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about last year. It's talking about Paul's pedigree, Paul's religion, Paul's background. Paul said, what things were gained to me, I count loss for the excellency of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and no count them but done that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. So look at it. Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then, of course, <laughs> the purpose of life is a yielded life. Turn once again to Romans that we looked at, and I'll tell you, what a great book, the book of Romans, and talks about sin, sin, and you just read that first chapter, you see how man has fallen away into sin. Second chapter, the sin of the Gentiles. Third chapter, the sin of the Jews, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Chapter four, the life of Abraham. Chapter five, justified by faith. Chapter 6, dead to sin. Dead to sin. Again, uh, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. And then jumping to verse 13. Neither yield, that word yield is the same word, that we have in Romans 12, 1, present, yield yourself. So a surrendered life, a self-denied life, denied life, a crucified life, a yielded life, yielded to the Lord. <clears throat> Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness in the sin, but yield yourselves in the God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And then this is a unselfish life. Look at Corinthians again, chapter 10. An unselfish life. <laughs> We're selfish, aren't we? The three amigos, me, myself. 
and I. And thank the Lord their prodigal did come back. And God prepared for him a robe, a ring, and shoes, a fatted calf. This, my boy, was lost, and now he's found. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. So again, an unselfish life. And then our life should be lived in the will of God. Go back to our text. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. <clears throat> we should live our life in the will of God. Don't you have a will for your kids? You want the best for your kids? <clears throat> Solomon wrote, train up a child in the way it should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That's not a promise, it's a principle. Train up a child in the way that he, she should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart. Well, we pray they would come back. Remember, metal has a bend. You, if you just run into a car and don't break the metal or the paint, uh, you can pull it back out because it has a memory. And we trust that our children, children in the best homes, children in the preacher's home, children in the missionary's home, children in the evangelist's home, it is said of, of Billy Sunday that he won a million people to the Lord but lost his boys. It was said of Harry Ironside, he won thousands to the Lord but lost his boys. It was said of Oliver B. 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 Green that he won hundreds and thousands to the Lord but he lost his boys. Why do those things happen? Why do the best families go awry? Why do street children sometimes come to the Lord and, and live faith in the Lord? I don't have the answer to that. And neither do you. But the answer is it's a matter of choice. It's a matter of will. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your body a living sacrifice. So we must present our bodies to God. And then here's the hardest thing of all. You know, sin is a slippery slope. You ever slip? A um, few months back, I surprised Mrs. Glennon on Sunday night after church. And I ordered her a meal. And I went to pick it up. And going to pick it up, I had to step over a, a snow um, pile. And when I stepped over it, I keep forgetting that I'm old. <laughs> the other day, I, I moved some stuff. We had some flooring done in our home, and then they messed up, and they had to <coughs> use <coughs> some of our flooring. And so, nice company, they bought us more flooring. So I went to pick it up. Should have had you come and help me. <coughs> Heavy flooring. So I took it out of the back of the vehicle and I went to pick it up. <coughs> My hips are still killing me. And you forget you get old. Anyway, I fell down going to get Mrs. Glennon's meal. She couldn't see me. What's a good thing she didn't see me because she may have come to help me. But I fell down. And it's an embarrassing thing to fall down. It really is. I mean, it's an embarrassing thing to fall down and uh, in the snow. And there I was, nice suit pants on, muddy in the snow. And then I tried to get up. A little hard to get up with a broken hip, but a hip replacement. But I still, I still cannot leap single buildings in a single bound. I'm still not faster than a sloth, <clears throat> but trying to get back up. And then I was about ready to fall again, but I didn't fall. And then I went in, and then I got the stuff and I came out and a taxi cab driver was sitting there watching all this. And he said to me, are you okay? 
I said, excuse me? I said, you saw me fall and you didn't help, and you're asking me, are you okay? I slapped him. <laughs> I didn't slap him. But that's the way some people are. Are you okay? No, I'm not okay. I've fallen into sin. I slipped. I didn't mean to slip. Paul said to the people in Hebrews, uh, let's just slip. Terrible thing to slip and to slide. You have no control. It's like one of our dear ladies comes across, and I apologize for the parking lot, but this guy is not doing his job. And uh, he used to come Sunday mornings and, and uh, do the parking lot, and it was nice and fresh. And apparently he, now he's coming on, on Saturday nights. And we got another whack of snow. Is this not the worst year we've ever had in a long time? I'm envious of some people that were not around. And, uh, and I'm praying for lightning. No, I'm not. But, uh, but this has been a horrible year. And, and I have to watch my attitude. Again, talking about sanctification. But I have to watch my attitude. And uh, because people say, we're going to shovel your snow. The city has what's called the snow devil. Called snow angels. Well, somehow ours has been kidnapped. Because he has not showed up but one time. And we've had a lot of snow. And... Uh, so I don't know when I'm talking about this, but I'm enjoying myself. And uh, so separated from the world. So tomorrow I have to get on the phone. And when they send you this letter, they say, don't be derogatory towards your snow angel. You know, like some places you go, there's a sign, don't be unkind. What? <laughs> you lost my what? You can't do that anymore. You have to be very gentle and kind. Oh, our microwave, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. They delivered it last month. We've been waiting since August. It's not working. So they had to take it back down. And I was nice. I, I, I ooze with nice. But I was nice, I really was. So then they said, well, I've sent it back. I said, yeah, because I don't want that one. That was in December, beginning of December. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited. You'd think they would call and say, now your new one is going to be coming. Never heard a thing. So I called the store, and I said to them, um, you know, hear anything about our microwave? Oh, I'll look right into that. So finally, the girl was polite, new girl. She said, it'll be here in March. I said, what? How's that possible, March? Anyway, so I have a bad snow angel. I have a bad furnace comp or furniture company, but I have to realize this is God's will. <coughs> it's God's will that I shovel the snow this morning. You're not crying. Shoveled the snow this morning before I came to church. And uh, so it's God's will. So Paul said, and be not conformed to this world. Again, there's that worldliness. But be it transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove it is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. So I must separate from the world. I must seek the word of God. And I must separate from the world. Now think about that. So what is God's will for my life and your life? Luke 8, Luke 18. So again, our life should be lived in the will of God. How can I know the will of God? Well, I'm going to submit my body to him. I'm going to separate from the world. I'm going to seek his word. There are many things we already know as God's will. Luke 18 and verse 1. Luke 18, verse 1. Men out always to what? Luke 18, when men must always, men must always, men ought always to pray and not to faint. God's will number two. God's will that we read his word. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Isn't that elementary? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. God's will number three, that we attend church. 
Let us not forsake the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some are, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So come to church. It is God's will that we tithe. I preached last week, Sunday morning and Sunday evening on tithing. And will a man rob God? Yet you rob me in tithes and offering. It is God's word that, word that we separate, God's will that we separate from the world. Separate from the world. Have no fellowship with the works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It is God's will that we witness and tell others about Jesus. And then finally, our right priorities in life. We're in, we're in Mark, uh, or we're in, we're in Luke. Turn to Mark chapter, um, or Matthew, I'm all right. Matthew chapter 6. Right priorities of life. You know where I'm going, I'm sure. Matthew 6 and verse 23. But seek ye, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. That's the anxiety from verses 25 through 34. God's people living in anxiety, right priorities of life. Life is too short to be wasted. Take therefore, verse 34, no thought for the morrow. That's tomorrow. For the morrow should take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Our life, James says, what does he say about our life? James chapter 4. James chapter 4. How long are you going to live? If we had a clock up here on the wall, and 12 at the top, 6 at the bottom, 3 at the side, 9 over here, where are you on that clock? James chapter 4 and verse 14 says, Whereas you know not what shall be, see it, on the morrow. I don't know, I may not be here tomorrow. It's like our money here today and gone tomorrow. So I may not be here tomorrow. You may not be here tomorrow. You ever think about that? Or as you know, what shall be on the morrow? For what is your life but a vapor that appeareth for a little time? So what if man's life is three score and ten? How much is that? Seventy. Or if by chance it be four score, how much is that? Eighty. So where are you in God's timetable? And again, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day to bring forth. So right priorities, of course, living for the Lord, not wasting our life, and that our life, life should be centered, uh, not centered in the world. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Now, again, over and over tonight, I'm talking about the world. Love not the world. It should not be centered in the world. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. So here is a preacher called of God. Here is a missionary. Here is an evangelist. And one day God calls them to preach. God calls them into the ministry. And they go to the mission field. And they recognize, man, it's not an not a easy task. And they get in the ministry. The first year it's a honeymoon. They love you so much they want to eat you. The second year, they eat you. And then the evangelist. The evangelist seems to have it easy. He shows up, preaches, gets his love offering. And by the way, if he gets his love offering before he preaches, it's good too. Because it doesn't matter because he's already got his love offering. So the evangelist shows up and everybody, ooh, ooh, I've never heard that before. And the poor pastor has been there for years preaching the book of Romans and the evangelist shows up because you're used to the pastor. Just like right now, you're saying, okay, how much longer? <laughs> I, I wonder how much longer. And I praise the Lord I'm here tonight. Praise the Lord I can preach tonight. But notice the problem. No man, verse 4, no man that warreth and tangled himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him has, who has chosen him to be 
a soldier. Being a soldier for the Lord, how precious that is. Our life is not centered around this world, but another world. And then we're to be mindful of our time. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Our time is important. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 and 16. See then that you walk how? Circumspectly. Our hearts fixed and focused on the Lord. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. How? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. What should a Christian's priorities be? Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. What should your priority be, really? I mean, what should your priority be? What should my priority be? Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt what? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Nothing is more important than our devotion to God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Our devotion for the Lord. Lord, thank you for a good night's sleep. Especially those of you who have been suffering with coughs and colds and sniffles. And, uh, and, and I don't know what's been going on. But for like almost two and a half weeks, I had insomnia. I couldn't sleep. I, I couldn't sleep. And if I did sleep, I had the weirdest dreams. I mean, the weirdest dreams I think I've ever had in my life. I don't know, maybe it's part and parcel of getting old. But I, I just couldn't sleep. I got to where I dreaded going to bed at night. Dreaded it. Didn't want to go to bed. I thought, oh my goodness, here's another night of tossing and turning. But then I remember the Bible says, He giveth His beloved sleep. And so eventually, I did get some sleep. But thinking about the Lord. And sometimes when I can't sleep, I just start quoting verses. I don't count sheep. I, I quote verses and begin to quote verses. And then sometimes then I'll doze off. We should love God more than self. We should love neighbor more than self. Second priority, how about your family? How about your family? It's too late when they're grown up to spend time with family. And notice Ephesians 5, of course. Second priority in life, devotion to our families. Thank God for our families. Our kids, what do we always say? They grow up too fast. There they are, and suddenly they're going off to school. Suddenly they're married. Suddenly it's like that old a song, uh, Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon and my son has no time for me because I had took no time for him. My daughter has no time for me because I had no time for her. We're to love our family, Ephesians 5, 28, to love our families. Ephesians 5, 28, so ought men to love their wives. Boy, there's the key to marriage, love your wives. If you love your wife, she will acquiesce and love you back. What's the commandment? Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. So ought men to love their wives, verse 28, as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And then we're to look at our children. Look at chapter 6 and verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Notice Colossians chapter 3. Just turn over to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Being an absentee father, being too busy for your children. Again, 
Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And of course, we're to provide for our family, 1 Timothy 5, 8. But how about our devotion to the church house? To the church house. Hebrews chapter 10, you know where I'm going. But family and church ought to be synonymous. Our children went soul winning with us on the Saturday. We would go soul winning on Saturday and bus calling on Saturday from 8 o'clock in the morning to sometimes 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Church became the center of our life. I can remember riding a bus and my son sitting, he couldn't do that today, my son sitting right there in the window. He could have, you know, the, it was closed so he couldn't fall out. But the church, bus calling. Breakfast at church, then calling all day long for hours. Sow winning. Taking our kids sow winning. And our daughter said one day, Daddy, I need to be saved. And we led her to the Lord. And then one day my wife, alone with our son, reading a story about a dude. And uh, he always wanted to be a dude and ride a motorcycle. And she read the story about this dude. And then she read the story about this old man who said no to God, no to God, no to God. And then he got too old. And God came and he said no. And it was too late. And so that touched our son's heart. And my wife said, now what about that guy? He went to hell. And you want to go to hell? No. And so at a young age, our boy made a decision for the Lord. But church and home. Now the first institution that God established was the church. And then government. And the government has gone to hell. I say that not disrespectfully. The government has totally gone to hell in a wheelbarrow. And then number three, of course, Jesus died for the church. So again, synonymous, home and church. Church and home. And Hebrews 10, 24, <coughs> let us consider one another to provoke in the love and good works, not for, where, where's everybody over here from this side? <laughs> Just think, where are they? Now next week, I'm talking, I'm gonna talk about the investment in our church. Well, where are the other people over here? Don't pan it with the camera, but where, where are they at tonight? Maybe they're sitting home with their feet up and listening to me. I don't know. But where are they tonight? If we're to provoke one another to love and good work, preacher, we've heard that so much, quit hammering it. No, I'm going to hammer it. And you say you're preaching to the, to the choir. The choir needs it. I need it. Let us consider one another to provoke on the love and good works, not forsaking the assembling together as a matter of some art, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day of coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. So God, family, church, and then work. 1 Timothy 5, work. Work. Work is necessary. Work is necessary, but remember, your work is to get you to be able to supply the needs to your family and your church. But some people get too wrapped up with work that work becomes the tail wagging the dog. School, kids get so, I said this a couple weeks, kids get so wrapped up in school that they get involved with extra um, Let's see, what's the word? Extra curriculum. They get more school. And before you know it, school has become their God. And no longer the Sunday school teacher, but the school teacher. And the school, extra curriculum, extra activities, extra time, extra school, and of course work. Work is a necessity. And uh, you need to work a job. And thank the Lord you have a job. But if any provide not for his own, Paul said, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infantile. So we should work. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. So the priority of God first, right priorities, family second, Church third and, and, and uh, job way down on the list, four. 
The job. Job is necessity. You need a job. And thank the Lord if you have a job. I've had a job now for 37 years. Same job. Same job for 37 years. Showing up for 37 years. How many sermons have I preached? How many years cleaning the toilet? Cutting the grass with a push lawnmower. You're not crying. Shoveling snow. Working for the Lord. And I praise him and I thank him for what he's done for us over the years. I praise him and thank him for his goodness to us. Notice Proverbs 22, 29. See, see it thou a man diligent in his business. He shall stand before kings. He should not stand before mean men. And then how about a little bit of pleasure. Time with pleasure. Now, people reverse that. <gasps> More time with pleasure, job, family, <clears throat> church, family, and God. And God's on the bottom of the list because of pleasure. We're in Proverbs. Look at chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Nothing wrong with enjoying yourself. Nothing wrong with having some time away. Jesus said, come apart. They were so busy they couldn't eat. Jesus said, well, come apart. So the Bible teaches us the work ethic. And then, of course, spending time. With the, think about the ant. Proverbs 6, 6. Go to the ant, thou slugger. Consider her ways and be wise which having no guide, overseer, ruler, provided her meat in the summer and guided her food in the harvest. And then Ecclesiastes, go back there now, after Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Look at chapter 11. Ecclesiastes, chapter 11. Devotion and duty again. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. These are the whole duties of man. But look at chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thy heart, and the sight of thy eyes. But know thou that for all these things God shall bring thee into judgment. Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth our vanity. Look at chapter 12. Remember now thy creator and the days of thy youth. I've said this, and it seems like when I say stuff, Satan is listening, and I know that he is. I sometimes say, watch out what you say. But I praise the Lord and thank the Lord for our young people. Thank the Lord for our young people. Being faithful to the Lord, serving the Lord, and then one day I look around and they're gone. Like I said from the beginning, they, they get gone. Something about making money. I remember when I worked and shoveled snow for 25 cents. 25 cents. I remember shining shoes in the bars as a young boy to make money. And I have been working, I guess, all of my life. I have been working. And so there's nothing wrong with working. But there came the time in my life where work and making money became my priority. And the devil knew just exactly how to get a hold of my heart. As a 19-year-old boy, I surrendered my life to the Lord. I still remember the time, remember the place, on my knees, surrendering my life to the Lord. We were poor. You've heard the story before. My mom was a waitress. Uh, four of my brothers now are in heaven. Two I haven't seen. One went there a few years back, and now on Saturday, my 
youngest brother went to heaven. So four of my brothers in heaven. But I think about how poor we really were. And some of you were really poor too. Didn't have shoes as a teenager, didn't have shoes. I remember as a little boy, I don't know, I must have been eight, nine years old, maybe 10, visiting a neighbor boy and they had me spend the night. And he had pajamas in the drawer, clothes hanging in the closet, ironed a little boy. And I remember being in that home and feeling so ashamed and being poor. And we were poor. So I appreciate things. And I appreciate hard work. But the devil just got a hold of my heart. I was never really discipled in the things of the Lord. I got saved, but that was about it. And you heard the story, the church had a split, and so I didn't have a way to church. But I guess I could have hitchhiked. But I got to making money. And money began to be my God. So I know what I'm talking about. And when young people begin to make money, and you make more money, it, it gets a hold of you. And money becomes your God. Not meaning to, but you get to making money. So priorities. God first, and our family, and our church, and our job, and then time of leisure. Some time just to take a little break and enjoy some leisure time. Shall we stand together? The right purpose, the right philosophy, setting ourselves apart for the Lord. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nine, when thou shalt say, as the prodigal, as we gave the illustration earlier, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. So, every day in the world, we have a choice. Whether our devotion will be for the Lord, whether our devotion will be with our family, whether our devotion and really family and church is synonymous. Be for the, the church house, bringing up our family and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Whether our job will become our God. And rather sometimes, and some people get so wrapped up in leisure that they've got to go to their cottage. Nothing wrong with having a cottage. They've got to go and have, be entertained more than having that priority to say God is first place in my life. It pays dividends, shall we pray. And Lord, that prodigal came home. And yet the older brother never went to the far country, never wasted his substance on riotous living. And when his younger brother came home, rather than rejoicing, he refused to go in the house. And the father had to come out and say, Son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. We should rejoice and be merry. For this thy brother was lost and is found. O oh God, we pray that in this new year, as it unfolds before us, that we may see some of the prodigals come home. We may see some families put back together, some lives prioritized by putting you first, and that you would have the center of our lives. 
and we'll be careful to thank you for that. Lord, every day in the world we struggle, if we're honest. We struggle with this business of sanctification, setting our part, ourselves apart for thee. And the world siren is sounded, and the flesh is beckoning, and the devil is stirring and sifting. But, oh God, help us to remember what you told Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to sift thee as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. And when thou art converted, sanctified, and set apart, strengthen the brethren. Lord, help us in these days. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my soul. As today, once again, having the privilege to listen to men who've gone on before me and who are with you now and listening to them back in the 60s and 70s and talking about the apostasy and talking about the decline in the church house. Oh God, I thought again this afternoon if those men came in this generation and saw in this 21st century how the church is gone, how many preachers who put their hands to the plow now have turned back, how many evangelists has changed their message and compromised on the truth for a love offering. How many missionaries go to the field and realize it's not an easy task and they begin to change their message and their methods and they look at methodology rather than the ministry. God have mercy. And Lord, that you would encourage those men around the world today. It seems to be a little late and many colleges no longer have young men going to the mission field, going into the ministry. Many churches empty, closed up. Many ministries in the church no longer functioning because no body to fill the void. God have mercy. Lord, may Emmanuel tonight be rekindled and revived to say, though nobody come, I'm going to come. Though nobody stand, I'm going to stand. Though no one fight, I'm going to fight. Though no one be faithful, Count me faithful. And Lord, and the conclusion, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of man. For one day, Lord, all the wrongs will be righted. All the hidden things, hidden to man's eyes that we do for you will be rewarded. And your coming and your reward is with but help us to be found faithful. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, can I pray for you tonight? Preacher, remember me in closing prayer on the matter of my priorities with the right philosophy, the right purpose, and the right priorities in my life. Remember me in closing prayer tonight. God has spoke to my heart. Remember me tonight. Remember me. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you for being here tonight. And Father, we, we do love you. And Lord, we're so frail. We're so weak. And the devil knows that. And how he jumps on us and condemns us and is condescending to us and is critical of us. And Lord, when we slip, he jumps all over us. 
But Lord, we thank you that a just man falls seven times, but he gets back up. A just lady falls seven times, but she gets back up. God, help us to keep on getting up and being faithful. And as Dr. Malone said one day, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Thank you for the people of Emmanuel. Lord, help us to keep on keeping on. Get us home safely this evening. And oh God, tomorrow, the last day of January, help us to get our priorities right, that we belong to you. And Lord, You can look at us and say, he's mine, she's mine, they're mine, they belong to me, oh God. As Elijah said, the God for whom I stand. As Paul said in him, we live and move and have our being. Help us to be mindful each moment of the day each moment of the day to walk in the spirit, not fulfill the lust of the flesh, is my prayer in Jesus' name.